Hi, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Penn State Burke Fly Inside chat. Go ahead and check your settings, and we'll get started momentarily. Oh, uh, we don't get to see who's here, though, do we? Well, you can look in the participants. Oh, I see. Yeah. Ah, attendees. Got it. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the Penn State Burke Fly Inside Chats Major League Prepared Series. Come on in and welcome to our campus. We're so glad that you could join us today. My name is Sonia Delacueto, and I'm one of three Lion Side Chat moderators working alongside Professor John Pfeiffer Wrights and Dr. Ryan Hassler. Before we get started, we wanted to share that you should please feel free to submit questions throughout the program via the Q&A feature. We will not be utilizing the hand feature today. Once the presentation concludes, we'll facilitate a discussion with our majorly prepared session facilitators, and we'll also be recording today's session so you can revisit the topic or even share the experience with your friends and family. Now, I am so excited to introduce Dr. Dust Justin D'Angelo, our lead presenter today, who will be speaking on how science can change the world, along with his colleagues, Dr. Ike Shipley and Dr. Maureen Dunbar. All right, and so Ike's going to, all right. going to get us going here. Here we go. Um, I want to echo Sonia in welcoming you. Uh, we're going to take a minute to introduce your three brilliant moderators today and we will be bouncing back and forth whichever one of us can answer your question best uh, we do have some prepared remarks and hopefully you are going to ask us things that will launch us into productive discussions so without further ado i will start and i will tell you that my name is ike shibley i have been at penn state 25 years um, I have been the program chair of science since its inception in 1999. And I, we've worked with a lot of students to move into scientific careers in a variety of areas, uh, anywhere from working in the pharmaceutical or biotech industry to optometry school, dental school, PA school, vet school, med school, uh, PhD programs. And I'm, I'm a chemist, I'm a biochemist by trade, uh, but I really get jazzed about helping students kind of find their dream. I don't try to turn all students into biochemists. So, all right, I'll let Justin introduce himself. So hi, I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Justin D'Angelo. I have not been at Penn State as long as Ike has. I've, uh, this is my sixth year. Um, I am the program chair of the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology program. So we just call that BMB because it's a mouthful to say the whole thing. Um, and so I'm yeah, newer to the scene here, but I um, am very uh, passionate about uh, getting students involved in uh, science, learning science and doing science by doing research and all that other kind of good stuff that we'll talk about later in this, uh, this chat. So uh, welcome. I guess it's my turn. <laughs> I'm Maureen Dunbar. I'm the program chair of the biology degree at the Berks campus. And I've been at Berks now for 20 years. So I'm, I'm one of the longer term people here. And I've been the program chair of the biology degree since it started at the Berks campus. Gosh, I guess about 10 years now, um, we've had the biology degree and we do have two options of the biology degree. We have the, the general biology option and also the genetics and developmental biology option. Um, and I am always looking forward. And um, one of the things I think that <clears throat> you might find is all three of us can answer questions for any of the degrees that we're talking about today because we're, we all work together uh, pretty closely for all three of these degrees. So you can meet with any and one of us. That's right. We're cross-trained. Oh, yeah. and James is here too. Awesome. So if you have admissions questions, you want to say hi, James? Put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I appreciate being here with us today. My name is James McCarty. I'm an assistant director of admissions here. So if you have any admissions related questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Uh, and I'll pass it back to all of our awesome science faculty. <laughs> all right. I like the, I like the adjective awesome. So we, we titled this, How Can Science Change the World? Uh, one of the things we'd like to do, well, we have three main goals. One is to convince you to study science in some way, shape, or form. Two is maybe study science at Penn State. 
And three, if you decide to come to Penn State, maybe we can convince you to stay at Berks. But at the minimum, we'd like to give you enough information so you can decide whether you want to study science, whether you want to come to Penn State to study science, and whether you want to stay at Berks to study science. So um, there are some images up here of the different ways that science influences the world. And um, in all these cases, you do need a firm understanding of some of the coursework that we're gonna talk about. Students often ask, why, why do I need calculus? Because mathematical modeling is important if we're gonna look at climate change. Um, certainly calculus is important if you're going to look at any type of technology, it doesn't have to be a satellite, but um, technology is important in a lot of pharmaceuticals anymore, in biotech, a lot of medical devices now have technology. Um, 23andMe is uh, genetic testing, and the, the more we understand about the human genome and the genome of all organisms on the planet, the better prepared we're going to be to do things like fight this particular um, organism. <clears throat> that's, that's a picture of a um, COVID-19, that's a coronavirus. And science is in the news right now, but science has also been under attack. Um, and what we need in the scientific community is an understanding of the limits of science also. Science can answer a lot of things, but it can't answer whether your favorite restaurant should shut down for an indefinite period of time. Um, so there, there are things that you can study in science and make informed decisions about, but then you also need other areas of expertise, which is like what we call our, which is like, oh my gosh, I sound like the valley. Valley boy. Um, sorry, that was an 80s reference because I've been here a while. Scientists have to take general education courses at Penn State. Why? Students say, oh, why, why do I need art courses? Why do I need humanities courses? Do, do I really need social sciences or health and wellness? And the answer is definitively yes. You, you need to understand how science is situated in the broader world. You do, you're, you're not gonna be able to do science in isolation. And we're here to work with colleagues across all disciplines to help bring this together. By the way, uh, Eric Lander is on the left who is just appointed to um, the Biden administration. Edward O. Wilson is still writing into his 90s. I think a lot of you know Anthony Fauci, who's been the public face of uh, the public response to the pandemic. And all of them have to write and speak regularly. You need to take technical writing. You need to take composition. You need to take oral communication. And you also need to understand how communicating is important for people who aren't scientists. So understanding um, thing, concepts in the humanities and the arts helps you become a better communicator, a better scientist, a better thinker. So that is my um, introduction to why science can change the world and why you might wanna be a scientist. I'm gonna let Justin talk about how you actually do it. Thanks, Ike. So, um, so when you think about how you study science, the first thing you might think about is taking courses in a classroom, which is important. And as Ike said, you need a broad foundation of different sciences, not just biology, if you're interested in biology or chemistry or you know, physics, it's important to uh, be somewhat well-rounded as more and more science is becoming interdisciplinary these days. But the other big way that you study science is by doing science. And um, so we make it a priority in our programs to include as much laboratory uh, experiences as we can. Um, and so some of those lab experiences are attached to specific courses that you may be taking. Some of them may be independent study, undergraduate research experiences, but by 
being able to get into a laboratory or working on a computer, right? There's lots of different ways that you can actually do science. Um, you will actually learn what a scientist does from day to day. It's not just memorizing a bunch of facts about the natural world. It's about using that information to test hypotheses and to make um, educated guesses based on previous work in order to move forward our overall knowledge of, of science. All right, next slide, Ike, please. Got it. So, so why should you study uh, science at Penn State? Well, um, the first question, so you can go to the next slide actually, Ike. So um, yeah. the first question is when was Penn State founded? So feel free in the chat to, you know, put an answer if you want, uh, take a guess. Yeah, do you guys know? I don't know. Do they know, Sonia? Does anybody know? I'm waiting to see if they're responding. Oh, we got one response. Don't be shy, don't be shy. This is about learning. <laughs> Oh, so we can see their chat. Yay, maybe? Yes. Okay. Ooh, it says, how do we respond when the chat is disabled? Is the chat disabled for? Oh. We do have the chat enabled if you want to give it a try again. All right, let's see if anybody can give it a whirl. There's got to be people. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, there it is. Yay. All right. There we go. Oh, Tina knew. <laughs> so, Tina's here. <laughs> so, um, so the answer is when Penn State was founded is uh, 1855. It was A. And so the reason we bring this up is that this shows that Penn State has been around for a really long time. And so we have a long history of um, developing uh, innovative and well-grounded curriculum in the sciences and other, and other disciplines to help you become a scientist. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Ike. So um, on this slide, we're showing the total enrollment of Penn State. So Penn State across the entire university has almost 100,000 students and about 80,000 of those are undergraduates. So we are a large institution. We, have, um, we are a, a, a land grant uh, institution that is focused on educating students in Pennsylvania. And that is our, that is our goal and our mission. Um, and so we have the resources of a very large uh, institution. So, it's, so we have a lot of, um, uh, funds and infrastructure at our disposal in order to, um, to teach scientists or students how to be scientists because let's be honest, doing science is not cheap. Um, but the nice thing is about Penn State Berks is that our enrollment is about 2,500 students. So out of that 80,000, you have a very small number of those at our campus. So you get a, a lot of individual attention However, you also get all the resources available to a large uh, institution. All right, and then I think I'll turn this over to Maureen. All right, so I, I get to pick up where Justin left off about why Penn State Berks. Um, so as you mentioned, 2,500 students versus 81,000 in the whole university. So definitely you're going to get, by staying at Berks, you're going, your class sizes are gonna be much smaller than they are at University Park. Um, I think some of, in the sciences, I think some of our largest enrolled classes um, have about 60 students in them versus at University Park, you're gonna be looking at hundreds of students in your general chemistry class, for example. So having that one-on-one -on -one interaction with faculty is also going to be helpful when there aren't these large class sizes. Um, most, like a, a, a great oh, majority, sorry, a great majority of, <laughs> of your classes are also going to be taught by full-time faculty members. Um, at University Park, a lot of classes are taught by graduate students and teaching assistants. 
we don't have those here. So most of your classes are gonna be taught by people who are here all the time and who are invested in your education. Um, the other reason is because in the sciences, we have a lot of faculty who focus on pedagogy, which is how to design classes that enhance student learning. And so a lot of that we put into our classes Many of our science classes are not taught in a traditional lecture format. There's a lot of question and answer in the classroom. There's a lot of technology. There's clicker questions, um, ways that really facilitate your learning of the material, not just covering the material. Um, the other advantage is undergraduate research. Now, there is undergraduate research opportunities at University Park, but they are much more difficult to get than they would be at Berks. Most of our faculty have active research programs. Most of us do take students into our labs. We have some theoretical scientists as well. Um, so we have lots of opportunities for students to, to get involved in, in research opportunities. Um, so lots of reasons that, that Berks is, is advantageous to your learning. Um, it's not for everyone, uh, right? Some people want some of the, the, the larger classes and the social interactions that you would get at University Park. But one of the things I think all three of us would, would say being program chairs is how close knit our, our students are. Um, they really do. By the time you get to your third and fourth year, we have a very close knit group of students who, who act very much like a family and, and they help each other out and they support each other. And I think it's much easier to get something like that at a small campus than it is at University Park. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. Oh, we have another, another chat question. So when yes. was Pensy Burks founded? And then there's a question too about um, how COVID's affected um, research opportunities that we should address. Oh yeah, we can. Um, so yeah, the, the COVID has <laughs> significantly affected research opportunities, um, right? When we went into full shutdown last spring, all of us had to shut our labs down. Um, and because of the social distancing, it, it, it has been difficult to get students back into the labs. Um, some of us have been trying to do other ways to engage students in research by having them work on posters or presentations, data analysis. Um, but we're, we're hoping that, you know, as, as conditions improve over the next several months that we're hoping to get students back into the labs. Um, but yeah, that it has definitely been a challenge over the last several, several months for, for getting students into research opportunities. Several people do seem to know when Berks was founded. Okay, go ahead, reveal. It was not founded at the same time that the university was. We are much younger, almost a hundred years, well, more than a hundred years younger. Yeah, yeah. Three years younger. Um, <clears throat> and we started as Why You're Missing Polytechnical, but, um, but we've been around for a while now and we've been a college for 20 years. So we're, and we have, um, I don't want to steal any thunder. Go ahead, because we have degrees too. Yeah, you can go to the next. Okay, yeah. So another chat. How many bachelor's degrees, baccalaureate degrees at Berks? I'm watching the chat. Let's see. Who's oh, there we go. Uh-oh. We might be wrong. <laughs> so we're calling. I thought it was 21. I don't know. Maybe we need James to weigh in here. James, what's, how many do we what's have? What's the official number? 21, right? Yes. Okay, that's what we thought. Yeah, 21. D. <laughs> okay, it's 21. Yeah. It's more than 20. How's that? <laughs> so this is actually another reason uh, to stay at Penn State Berks. There's 21 degrees here. We have, uh, right, three science degrees. The science degree with the life science option, the biology degree with two options, the BMB degree with two options. At University Park, it's a good thing. There are lots of other options available to you, but sometimes that can get a little bit confusing. And so sometimes narrowing down your options can actually be a benefit. Um, but, but we do have options for, for students to choose from in all three of our, our natural science degrees. Okay, next slide. Okay, which is a degree you can't complete here? Oh, 
Peggy knows. Sonia knows. Stumper. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, chemistry. So, so this is an example. If 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 you want a chemistry degree, if you want a, a bachelor's degree in chemistry, you do have to go to University Park. But any of the other three degrees, you can get at Berks. And we are the only campus outside of University Park that has the biochemistry, or we call it the, the BMB degree. So if you want the BMB degree, you only have two choices. You're either us or your University Park, which is really awesome because the reason we, when we proposed to get the biochemistry degree, we had done such a great job with biology and science that they said, sure, go ahead, do the biochemistry degree as well. And students are doing awesome in that too. So the biochemistry does have chemistry in it, just so we're clear. <laughs> Oh, is that what the highlighting? I was trying I to highlight it for you. <laughs> awesome. All right, next slide. Okay. Yeah, so female population of Berks is 40%. What's the percentage in science? Yeah, 65%. So that's that's a statistic we are really proud of because the sciences are, are traditionally not degrees that attract a lot of female students. And we we feel really proud of the fact that that we've been able to attract and, and retain female students in our in our degrees. 65%. That's that's really wonderful. And it that's kind of spread on all three degrees, right? It's it's not just one of the degrees is more predominantly female than the other. So, um, and we do have several uh, female faculty members also that can serve as role models to female students in the degrees too. So it's, again, we're really proud of that, that statistic. And that's been, that's been true for years now that, that we have that high percentage of female yeah. students. Okay, next slide. So courses that are absolutely required for all science degrees. It doesn't matter which campus you're going to or which degree that you're doing. And so we're just going to kind of list them quickly here. So the first one, all most science degrees, I shouldn't say all here, are going to need to take either Biology 110, which is Introductory Biology, or BMB 251, which is technically Cell and Molecular Biology, but it's kind of the equivalent to, to the Intro Bio. And they're um, the ones here at University Park, like physics wouldn't require this. Right. Chemistry considers it an option, but it's not required. So, but most, most science. Most science, yeah. biology. Um, this, this is one that students tend to struggle with a little bit or the calculus one and the calculus two, but if you're gonna get a science degree in, uh, at Penn State, you will take up through calculus two, um, absolutely. And uh, Penn State has recently just changed. We didn't put this on here, but we have a biology and biochemistry option of calculus. So it's Math 140B or Math 141B. And so most of our students take that because it's still the same content, but it's geared towards applications for your field rather than in the engineering field, which is what a lot of the other calculus is calculi. Um, <laughs> uh, general chemistry, yes. Yeah, so an entire year sequence of general chemistry, that's uh, Chem 110 and Chem 112 with their labs. Now, I don't know, I do all majors require the lab psych? Yes, there are some engineering majors that don't they require the labs as well. Majors, I think, do. I think even physics. Yeah. Okay. And then a year of organic chemistry, everybody's favorite course, and that has a lab that, that goes hey. along as well. <laughs> It is, I'm actually not kidding. Organic chemistry, which at least at Berks, um, it, students will tell you it's the, their favorite course that they take. Ike teaches it. Um, yeah. And so does Dave Arantz, um, for those of you who may know them. Um, <laughs> physics, so there are two physics sequences. Physics 250, physics 251 is an algebra-based physics. And then the 211 series is a calculus-based physics. So some degrees require the calculus-based, some, I should say some options, some degrees, and others you have a choice. A lot of this depends on um, how strong you feel in, in calculus, how strong you feel in math. And so uh, we work with students to try to decide which one of those sequences would be best for their career plans. 
Um, so those are, those are some of the required courses that you need for the science degrees. And what you're looking at here, this is just an example of what we call a suggested academic plan for the first four semesters. Uh, this would be for the biology degree for the ecology and general options. We just put one of them up here. But Penn State talks in jargon. <laughs> Math 140 is calculus one, bio 110 is Bio, oh, that's terrible that I don't know the official name. See, we know all of these courses by number. We don't know them by name. Um, but anyway, this would be kind of an idea of, of what your first four semesters would look like. You're gonna be taking usually a combination of a math, a biology and a chemistry, in addition to those important general education courses that I talked about earlier. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what every semester is going to look like for any science degrees. You're going to kind of have those combinations of the math, chemistry, physics is going to be in there as well. Um, so uh, typically for any of the science degrees, you're probably looking at 16 to 18, on average, 16 to 18 credits a semester. Um, some students take more than that. Um, we've had a number of students that can actually take enough credits to uh, graduate a semester early. It's a little challenging in the sciences, but it is po possible to do. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I'll just point out before okay. we leave that all the bolds and the asterisks and oh, yeah. the hashtags, they all have meanings. We're not going to bore you with that at this point. If you have questions about it, we can answer them. But um, but that it all, there's, there's a lot of nuances as to how to read one of these suggested academic plans. And, and I should mention before we go on, if you go back, this is a suggested academic plan. This does not mean that every student will follow this plan. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, we work with students to figure out a lot of it is uh, based on placement testing in math. Um, so, so it is suggested. It is not, this is not a hard and fast rule that students need to follow it exactly like this. Um, okay, so I'm going to turn this back over to Justin. All right, so um, so why would you choose one degree over the other, right? So we have three science degrees uh, on our campus, right? We have the life the science degree with the life science option or life science for short. We have biology and we have BMB. So why would you choose one over the other? Well, so if you want a very broad exposure to science and you need some flexibility, um, life science might be good for you. So we tend to tell students who are interested in physician's assistance programs because they need to get a lot of um, shadowing and clinical experience that the life science degree is a good um, option because it gives them flexibility. It's not like you have to take this course and this course and this course and they're locked into those. They get to make some choices that might be useful when they're trying to schedule their clinical hours. We also say the same thing to transfer students, right? That this gives a lot of flexibility to students who um, have a lot of transfer credits and they need to fulfill, uh, you know, say if certain requirements are filled and others they don't. So it gives the flexibility um, for that. If you're interested in biology, um, you can think about it from, um, you know, we think of little bio, uh, talking about cells and molecules, and then you can think about it as sort of big bio, where you're talking about organisms, and ecosystems, and things. And so, the biology degree will appeal to um, to both groups. I and mean, we have two different options, one for each group of, of, of folks. Um, so the biology degree gives you a broad exposure to biology with not a ton of chemistry. You have to take some chemistry like all of our degrees do, but it's not an, an intense focus. Um, and so folks who are interested in vet school and dental school, um, folks who are interested in, in, environment, in the environment and um, those sorts of things find the biology degree to be a good fit for them. And then folks who are interested in uh, chemistry tend to gravitate towards uh, the BMB degree. If you like chemistry, if you like cells and molecules, they gravitate towards BMB. Um, if you're interested in getting a lab job when you are done, working as a technician in a laboratory or going to graduate school, uh, BMB is a really good choice for you because we have a number of advanced 400 level lab experiences that uh, give you a lot of exposure and prepare you well for, um, for uh, working in a lab. So we give you the skills that you need to, to do this. Um, and students who are interested in medical school also tend to do BMB. So 
Why, where do our science graduates go? Well, so as I mentioned before, a lot of them get jobs. Um, so a lot of them do get lab jobs at different companies. Um, and I have some listed here, like Lancaster Labs, Merck, Charles River, a number of our recent grads have gotten uh, jobs there. Um, students also um, work for parks, environmental agencies. Um, so they get a wide range of, of positions. Uh, our students also go on to further schooling, maybe health profession schools, PA schools, vet schools, dental schools, medical schools. Um, and we're gonna actually have some of our uh, former students come back to another one of these lion side chats later this semester to talk about their experiences. Um, so we have a, a lot of uh, students that have gone on to those paths. And then also we have students going to graduate schools for genetic counseling, health, master's, PhD programs, and I've just listed some here. Um, we even actually just recently, right, last year, I think we have a student get into um, Harvard for their PhD program. So, so we, have, we have our students get into really good, um, good programs and go and do really great things. All right, so um, we've talked about a lot of this, why you would stay at Berks to, to, to do a science degree, but I'll you know, reiterate it here, um, that you're gonna get a small class size. So um, as Maureen said, our largest courses are gonna be capped at 60. Most of our courses are smaller than that. You'll uh, usually get courses that um, you have 20 to 30 students in your junior and senior year, you'll get courses regularly that size. Um, at UP, you could take in courses with 100 or 200 people, right? Um, so because our classes are small, you get to know faculty and we get to know you, right? We can't, or you can't hide, right? Uh, we know if you are there, we know if you're not there, and we know whether you're following along or whether you're not. So it's good for your uh, learning, right? And to keep you on track. Um, and it's the fact that we get to know you helps you to get let good letters of recommendation and uh, prepare for the next step in you know what you want to do in your life. So um, uh, I said that he likes the term awesome, right? So we are an awesome uh, faculty where we focus on teaching and we will uh, we are committed to um, getting you what you need in order to succeed and finish your degree. We are all academic advisors. And so we spend a lot of time meeting with students and helping them to determine what types of courses they need and what kind of extra opportunities are available in undergraduate research that uh, Maureen talked about to help supplement your uh, time at uh, Berks. And then of course, we are a community of science students and faculty. And so we have a number of programs that we run regularly. So uh, every year we have a, um, at the end of the year, we have a poster session where we highlight the undergraduate research that students have done um, over that year, uh, which is a great opportunity for students to practice some of those skills like communication that I talked about earlier. Um, and then we also have a little fun. So. One of my favorites is every year we have a Halloween party where we have a, the faculty have a theme uh, costume and we decorate the building uh, based on that theme and we all have costumes. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so we, we work hard and we play hard. So, you know, it's great. Go ahead. Ike. So I, I wanna wrap up is so that we have time for questions, but I also wanna point out at the end here that being at Berks allows students to do things other than just science related. Um, we have a lot of peer mentoring and they do have this at University Park also, but we actually initiated it and then University Park kind of um, tag, tagged along and they have a really good program too. But what we do is students who have done well in a course and who are, good explainers, good communicators. They'll actually retake the course, but they'll retake it as a mentor. And as we've talked about, we, we teach much differently than University Park does. At University Park, you will have a teacher at the front of the classroom, probably in 90% of your classes, just telling you things. At Berks, we, have, we do problem solving in small groups. We do clicker questions. And as students work through those, our mentors walk around and interact, answer questions. 
the mentors do get trained. So they take a course that um, Professor Hassler runs along with uh, Dr. Z, Professor Zakowitz. They, they train the students so that they, students, the mentors know how to elicit responses from the students. It, it helps the mentors, but it also helps the students who are learning for the first time. And so this is a great experience. I would say that like half of our pre-med students end up being mentors, maybe even more than that. Um, a lot of our science, science students, students are athletes. athletes. You can actually be an athlete and be a science major. Um, the athletes joke that they have to take books on away trips, but it's, it's, it's a really cool thing. We have a great NCAA Division three athletics program in a lot of different sports. And so our, we have a great athletic director. We have, it's just a great program. Um, we also, our clubs and organizations are phenomenal. Our student affairs team does really remarkable things. And this is not to say that University Park doesn't, it's just that it's, it's a lot easier to get involved. And because as um, we've alluded to, we have a very tight knit group of students. A lot of those students talk to each other. And so I think science majors make up a disproportionate number of Lion Ambassadors because the Lion Ambassadors then recruit people that they know for the next um, year. And so we have a lot of Lion Ambassadors. We have a lot of students that get involved in first year seminars to be mentors for that, to be, orientation leaders. Uh, we, had a, the, we had a science major who was the lead orientation leader two years ago. So I, I, science majors do more than just look in a microscope or run a, right, a, an IR spectrum of an organic sample or connect circuits in a physics lab. They're involved in the life of the college. And I think that's part of why Burke science students have some of the highest success rate, not only in graduating on time. Uh, we haven't looked across the entire system, but Burke's actually has one of the shortest times from student enrollment to graduation. Um, the average in the United States is five and a half years. Um, at Burke's, it's more like 4.2 years. So uh, like Maureen, I think said, we have students graduating a semester early, some graduate a year early. We, we work to make sure that you're getting the science education that you need, that you're getting the socialization that you need, and that you're getting a broad education so that not only do you contribute positively to the world, but you're happy when you do it. And our, our science students are like, this is, this is a graduation picture from a couple of years ago. And um, that, that pretty much, Caitlin's there, uh, exemplifies what's going on at Burke's in science. I mean, we're, you will love it. So, um, so come be a Burke science major. All right. We want to open this up for questions. Hopefully, you'll ask a few things so that we can um, continue talking. I don't know if you want to talk about generalities or specifics, but anyway, go ahead. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Good stuff for learning. <laughs> okay, so um, at, I would like to ask our audience members um, if you want to go ahead and add any questions to the chat. And actually, if, if you guys don't mind, I have a question of my own. Um, if I if I was hypothetically a high school student, um, what kind of courses do you recommend for me to be taking now um, to prepare me to come to Berks? Like, are we looking at college prep, honors, AP? Like, what what have your experiences been like with students that are? <laughs> we're all we're all smiling. This is one of those loaded questions. Um, we got to make this interesting, guys. Come on. All right. Um, so at least, and I think I'll, I'll let Justin and Maureen correct me, but we often recommend, if students want to take AP courses, we recommend things outside of science, um, AP Gov or AP History. And the reason for that is that 
a lot of times AP science courses focus so much on the test that you're not doing as much hands-on, students get a little more stressed, but it's also then you start out of sequence from the other cohort that's coming in with you. I mean, if you could start your, uh, I'm gonna go back to this sequence. If you can start in calculus, then you really don't need to place out of calculus. I think the goal is to get into calculus. So you don't have to take calculus in high school, but you should be taking at least trig and pre-calc. Um, you don't need to take AP biology, uh, but you definitely, if you can, an honors biology would be nice. Um, chemistry is kind of the same way. Physics is the same way. But um, I don't know what's my, my colleagues should weigh in on this. No, I'm, I'm in full agreement. Um, it, I, I think I tell students a lot of times, yeah, the, the, not that the AP courses aren't worthwhile, but I think that starting with your cohort when you're, when you're a first year student is really important. And if you're passing out of a lot of those classes through AP credits, you know, not only are you no longer with your cohort, but I, I, I do think sometimes you're losing some of those hands-on opportunities that you would get maybe in an honors biology or chemistry or even physics. Um, so yeah, I usually recommend to students if, you know, if, when we do open houses that, yeah, if you can focus on honors and not AP, I think that's better. And then focus on AP courses that are outside of sciences. I don't know, Justin, do you have a- My view of life is the AP classes can't hurt, but don't- test out of them, right? So, so, right, so if you take an AP Chem or you take an AP right. Bio, then still take general, general chemistry in college and take, then you'll have a foundation, right? But I wouldn't necessarily recommend if you scored whatever you needed to on the AP to get credit for general chemistry, for example, I wouldn't necessarily recommend to take those credits. I would recommend to take them in college. And Dawn asked a question about research opportunities. I wanna, I wanna just put one thing up here. Let's see. Ooh, I can do as a text because I'm doing a lot of these right now. These are called summer surf um, things, summer undergraduate research fellowships, which is especially important this summer in the pandemic uh, because students haven't gotten as much lab experience. Um, but research opportunities are still challenging because of student schedules, because um, we, we, can do, um, we can do limited experimentation, especially bench science at first. But if you want to see what a large research lab does, then you need to go somewhere over the summer. You need to go to um, a Cornell or a Syracuse or a University Park. Um, University of Tennessee. It, it gives, gives students a chance to get a 10 week intensive experience in research. And while, right, it's not about getting specific skills, it's about learning how to think like a scientist. And in a lot of ways, seeing the fun that comes along with science. Uh, research is cool. Um, Right, I, have a, I had a colleague in grad school who, who said, oh, if, if we could have a new discovery every day, everyone would do science, but science isn't like that. So the scientists are the one who are willing to put in months and months of work before they get to a really cool discovery. Um, but you'll get at least a taste for that doing these summer. They're sometimes called SERPs, sometimes called SERPs, Summer Undergraduate Research Programs. Um, are you different organizations? Go ahead. Yeah, there are used research experiences for that's undergraduates. That's the main program that's run through the NSF, I believe, right, Justin? Um, yeah, that, I mean, those are really important, especially now, <laughs> um, because it is difficult to get research experiences right now. Um, but even doing those things, I mean, we do have research opportunities here for students. Um, you know, and like I said, but but we are small, <laughs> um, so some of the the opportunities aren't going to be as much as if we would have um, 
Um, oh, so Dawn, to tell us what we do for oh. research. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll um, let you do, I will. I will at least say that I, when I first got here, I did fetal alcohol syndrome research. So I looked at the effects that alcohol has on a developing embryo, and I use a chicken embryo. Since I've become a program chair, I have focused more on pedagogy, but and so I. I don't work with undergraduates much, at least not in that arena, but these two do. So go ahead. Well, I'll let, cause, cause I think Justin will have more to say here than, than I will too. So um, yeah, I, I do have a research lab and I do um, take a couple of students into the lab, <laughs> or at least I try being a program chair. It is difficult cause I don't have as much time for research as I, as I used to, but um, I study, um, Memory gland development, breast cancer develop, breast cancer and memory gland development, and more specifically, I study the effects of alcohol on the development of the mammary gland, and I do it using an entire cell culture system. Um, uh, and I do, I, I, I try to take maybe two students um, into the lab a year. Um, every once in a while, it, it, it's hard. You had four a time, and it was it was. <laughs> It's especially with, with program chair responsibilities, that was really difficult to do. Um, but I'll let Justin, because Justin does quite a bit of undergraduate research. So yeah, one of my favorite parts of my job is doing research with students. And so um, I work on um, the genetic control of metabolism. So I'm interested in understanding the genes that are important for organisms to determine whether they should uh, store the food that they make. Uh, or use that, those calories for energy. And so I use a very genetic model system. So I use the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, um, as my model system. And we genetically manipulate, you know, various genes that are involved in various metabolic pathways to see what are the uh, physiological consequences. So do flies store more fat? Do they eat more? Do they, you know, do they change their, their, their gene expression? So we do a lot of um, those sorts of experiments. And I routinely have three to four undergraduates working with me every um, semester. Um, as, you know, Maureen and I said, it's been a challenge over the past year because of COVID. But I think, um, it, once this is over, right, I think there will be opportunities for undergraduates to do research in our lab. The, the, the procedure is essentially getting to know faculty and talking to them about their interests, and, you know, asking if there are any opportunities, right? And I think just you have to figure out who you click with and um, who you would like to work one-on-one -on -one with because doing research in a lab with a faculty member is um, quite an undertaking. It's not something that you take lightly to spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into it. So you have to be committed to it. So a matter of finding someone that you mesh with and the, that do uh, the um, types of experiments and research that you think is interesting. And we have a lot of opportunities to do that in this science division. And as chairs, the three of us are committed to continually trying to find more opportunities. Um, we're in the process of getting ready to uh, launch a search for um, another chemist. And we had a pedagogical chemist. So they, they did a lot of um, the design of our Chem 110 and 112, and that was great. But now we have an opportunity to bring in um, someone who's doing an undergraduate research program, right? That their research is hopefully bench science. That's what we're gonna look for because we want students to be able to get as much of that hands-on experience as they can. And so as chairs, we continually, as we're looking for new um, faculty, as we're thinking about how to design curriculum, uh, undergraduate, undergraduate research, research is, is always there because it's, it's a, a vital, vital component of what we do. And, and I think what, what the student does. does. So, so I'll mention, speaking of curriculum, so in the BA degree, we have these advanced 400 level lab experiences. And what we have been doing, the faculty who teach them, is trying to incorporate as many research projects into those laboratories as possible. Because we understand that not every student is going to be able to get a one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship-like opportunity. So we're trying our hardest to 
incorporate as many of these experiences into required courses so that students can get that sort of research experience um, without having to do a one-on-one -on -one scenario. And I, I should point out for those of you, whoops, new share, I wanna show you this. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is available in what's called the Penn State Bulletin, the University Bulletin. So if you just type in bulletins.psu.edu, you can explore the different types of programs, both here and at University Park. Um, so you could do it by, you could look for minors also, but if we just do like biology, I'm gonna uh, emphasize what, what Maureen pointed out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look, look at the at one the at University Park because, because what, what they, they have, have is, psh, 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 psh. they've got six different, different um, options option. uh, somewhere. There we go. They've got an ecology <laughs> option. They've, oh my goodness. They've yeah, got a it's not as easy option. to navigate that anymore. They've got, did I miss one? Genetics and developmental biology option. They've got a neuroscience option. They've got a plant biology option. They've got um, a vertebrate physiology option. As Maureen said, it gets, that's, it's exciting that there's so many options, but it's like, which one's perfect? Well. All of them, really. There, there's, there's no, no perfect, perfect degree. degree. Almost, Almost any science degree you get will launch you where you need to go. Uh, we're pretty comfortable with the three that we have that Justin um, talked about, the science, the biology, and the biochemistry. Each one of those has two options. So there's really six different tracks that a student could take. But the differences between them are probably only about 18 to 22 credits. Everything, Everything else is the same. same. So, so anyway, that's that's why you need advisors like, like us to help, help you decide <laughs> and how to navigate and get get some of these experiences. But yeah, for all of you, the the bulletin is a great resource. Um, you might not understand everything, but um, it's it's kind of you can do these academic plans that will give you. An idea that, by the way, that tells you all the asterisks and double daggers and anyway, and what all that stuff means. You almost need a degree in how to read the bulletin, but. That's great, thank you so much. Um, and, and again, I'd like to invite our audience if you have any questions to go ahead and, and add them to the Q&A. Um, but as you we were talking about your experiences, I know that there have been a lot of different successful students in your programs, traditional age through non-traditional. And if you could think about the characteristics that all of those students had, what are some of those common themes? Like, how would I know that I'd be a good fit for your program and, and what makes a successful student for the science program? Cool. Ooh. Um, That's an interesting question, Sonia. They're all hardworking. I think they're all curious in a lot of ways. They find that these aren't slog courses. They're not just things to get through. Um, students actually, as they move through, especially some of the sequenced courses, they develop a deeper understanding. And I think the more they understand, the more questions and the more curious they get. And so when you talk to our seniors, I don't think you're going to see them going, oh, thank goodness. I think you're going to see them go, yeah, I feel like I can go out and continue learning now. I want, I want to get a job or I want to go to grad school because I want to start applying what I've got and use it to learn even more stuff. I feel like our students are... And they are good communicators. They, they work well with each other, right? So, and I think it's probably because we do a lot of group work and a lot of you know group work in the laboratory, work in the classroom. So students, as Maureen said, get to know each other and become really close knit. And so that, you know, 
that personality trait. You don't, not everybody is an extrovert, right? We have a lot of uh, introverted students, but everyone seems to be very welcoming, right? And so, you know, group work is not a struggle most of the time, right? And most of the time, students do a really nice job and work with each other and work together. And that, I think, stems from the fact that they know each other, right? They yeah. meet each other again and again and again in a lot of different courses. And so by the time they're juniors and seniors, this is old hat, you know. That's a really good point because we have a lot of introverts in the program, a lot of introverts going to science, but you never know it from the way they interact with each other. And I think, and Sonia mentioned too, and I think this is an important point. Um, we do have a lot of adult students in all three of our programs as well. I mean, we, we have traditional age students, but, but we have a really high number of adult learners. And what's been really cool for me to see is how well everybody gets along, right? It isn't that the adult yeah. students stay to themselves and the traditional age students, they really blend and they meld. And, and it's just, it's been really nice to see that. And I, um, you know, I think it goes back to what Justin was saying is, is that our students work really well together regardless of how old they are or what their life experiences have been. Um, and, and I think that's really nice to see um, with, with our students in all of our degrees. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. great. Thank, Thank you, you all so very much for sharing all of this information today. Um, I would I would definitely like to thank you, Dr. D'Angelo, Dr. Shibley, and Dr. Dunbar um, for thank, uh, spending the time that you did with us. And I, for one, am feeling majorly prepared. Um, so <laughs> I'd like to also send a special thank you out to our audience for joining us today. And we will um, be sending out a survey to you as we exit out of the webinar. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out and give us some feedback, we would really appreciate it. You can also offer some ideas for future chats as well. And you're encouraged to reach out to us via email. And we want to remind you to keep uh, checking our website for upcoming client side chats. Our next chat is actually this Wednesday, February 10th at 12.15. When we will explore the hospitality management program here at Penn State first. So be sure to come back and meet with other faculty, staff, or students to learn more about exciting majors and experiences that you can have here at Penn State first. So stay safe, Berks and beyond, and we're signing off until next time. This has been the Penn State first Thank you. science side chat. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.